Hi, everybody. Good morning in the US and good evening in Europe. I am Brian Whitmore, Russia Program Director at SEPA, and I'd like to welcome you all to our virtual conversation on society's view on doing business in Russia. Now, this is part one of a three-part project that SEPA is doing in conjunction with the Levada Center that looks at modernizing trends in Russian society. Russia watchers have long assumed that strengthening property rights would foster the development of middle class in which small and medium-sized businesses would be the foundation of a more pluralistic political system. But we Russia watchers have also long understood that Russia has a deeply ingrained patrimonial political system in which money, property, and power are fused, where the rule of law and property rights are weak, and where patron-client relationships often, or actually usually, trump laws and institutions. And this makes the emergence of a state-dominated oligarchic business environment almost inevitable. And in this environment, how do Russians view entrepreneurship? What are society's views of doing business in Russia? Are these views changing? And can these attitudes spark bottom-up support for political change among Russians? Well, these are some of the issues we will explore in the next hour with the co-authors of the recently published report, Society's View on Doing Business in Russia, which was published on the SEPA website this week. And with that, I will introduce our panelists. Maria Snegovaya is an adjunct fellow at SEPA and a postdoctoral fellow at Johns Hopkins University. And Denise Volkov is a Moscow-based sociologist and deputy director of the Levada Center. Welcome to all of you. And by the way, by way of the way I want to structure this is to keep it interactive and to do a couple rounds of questions for our panelists before we field questions from our virtual audience. And I'd like to ask our panelists to keep your remarks brief. This will allow a lot of time for back and forth and for follow-ups and for audience questions. So Maria, let's let's start it off with you. Um, the report's findings show that Russians have a high opinion of entrepreneurs and that this is particularly pronounced among the young and the educated. In fact, this is the they're at the highest levels since Levada started measuring this, uh, this variable 16 years ago. Um, the positive attitudes about, toward entrepreneurs and business are, 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 are uh, most pronounced among young people and among highly educated people. But on the other hand, trust in the business sector is actually much lower than that of other public and political institutions. It's lower than the army, lower than the president, lower than the security services, and lower than the church. And also among the most respected Russian business people, respondents primarily named state-linked oligarchs rather than true entrepreneurs um, who develop their own business from scratch. So I was wondering, Maria, if you could start up by looking at your top line findings, but also explaining that, that apparent contradiction. Yeah, thank you, Brian. Uh, so uh, first of all, I wanted to start by summarizing the key findings. Uh, thank you, Brian, for already highlighted some of the most important ones. And I just wanted to expand a little bit for those parts of our audiences uh, that those in our audience who haven't uh, read the report. Uh, so overall, um, we see consistently the narrative that, you know, Russians are traditional, that they uh, don't understand um, the contemporary world, that they're traditionally orient oriented. Uh, this is why this kind of uh, reports and analysis are extremely important, since they tend to actually reject a lot of those uh, common assumptions. In fact, we do find evidence of the so-called modern, modernizing uh, trends uh, within the Russian society, specifically the fact that there is significant improvement in the attitudes towards uh, entrepreneurs. And um, it keeps speaking despite the fact that you would see that the crown policies uh, that are actually attacking the entrepreneurship and businessmen in Russia are uh, actually trying to do uh, the opposite. Uh, at the same time, however, Russians unfortunately do not live uh, in an, um, you know, in a vacuum, and that's actually Brian answers uh, addresses your question directly. They are still uh, consume the um, information that's provided by the state uh, federal TV channels uh, to a large extent, and because of that, of course, uh, the opinions are also shaped uh, by what they're told um, uh, by the Kremlin. 
As a result, uh, for example, uh, when it comes to the importance of different institutions, they value army or the president much higher. Um, and of course, uh, here we're talking of the Russians more broadly, rather the most educated and the youngest and the most uh, modernized uh, social groups. Uh, we also find a very interesting discrepancy uh, uh, in that even if Russians view or businessmen entrepreneurs uh, increasingly positively, uh, there's a rising reluctance to engage in business activity, um, again, uh, based on our uh, uh, results. Uh, while a quarter, about a quarter of the population wants to open the business, in fact, uh, the number of people who want to has been uh, dec decreasing quite dramatically. Uh, over the years, again, I wouldn't necessarily say that is irrational. I think it's actually quite uh, rational given what they observe on the ground, right? The business conditions are pretty bad in Russia. It's just not, not just investment on outflow, but also constant attack, attacks by the uh, different uh, state agencies on businessmen, prosecution, um, that definitely creates to this climate, which makes it not very attractive for people to make uh, business. And the second uh, fact, uh, as I mentioned before, the fact that they're uh, consumers of TV uh, information definitely biases uh, the answers. For example, it's very visible in, uh, uh, again, Brian, to answer your question, who they name is their main, most important businessman in Russia. Uh, most of these people end up being states linked one way or another. I, for example, explain it primarily by the, the importance of media consumption. It's just that the majority of the population primarily hears uh, about uh, these people on uh, TV and they don't hear much about successful global level entrepreneurs. Uh, who are able um, uh, to do things. It's also linked, of course, unfortunately, to um, a state persecution. Uh, in the 19, uh, in the 2000s, I'm sorry, uh, when the uh, media situation was much free in Russia, of course, uh, such, uh, for example, the investigation against uh, Yukos uh, was every, every on, on all TV channels. And so, for example, we uh, noticed that until now, Russians name Mikhail Kadarkovsky among uh, key businessmen. Uh, this is just a reflection of the media landscape. I wouldn't necessarily, uh, you know, uh, say that Russians only prioritized state-linked businessmen. It's just that they tend to hear about those people more uh, than they hear about uh, regular um, startup uh, grassroots uh, people. And ultimately, of course, it's important to point out, while the prevalence of illegal greater seizures of business in Russia is not necessarily mentioned as a key obstacle to doing business, um, as a key obstacle, they primarily uh, name economic issues. Uh, there's a lot of awareness about uh, half of respondents uh, reported the prevalence of unlawful pressure on business in Russia by the uh, inspection bodies. That actually tells you that the awareness about this uh, situation is still quite high. Uh, so the media environment does not limit the exposure to this news. And again, uh, this is hardly um, surprising that many of our respondents, despite viewing entrepreneurs positively, do not necessarily openly express willingness to engage uh, in business activities. Maria, since you were so disciplined in keeping your comments brief, I'm going to stick with you for a minute. Um, I, I do want to drill down just a little bit more on this idea of most Russians named entrepreneurs, whether they name state, they name state-connected oligarchs. Because when I think of entrepreneurship, I think of your self-made person. I think of your Steve Jobs or your Bill Gates who built your own business without the help of the state. And I was wondering if any of your, if, if any of your questions kind of drilled into understanding of what entrepreneurship is, because if people are naming state-connected oligarchs who are effectively making their money off of rent-seeking, not off of, off of entrepreneurship. Entrepreneurship is the pra practice of building a business on your own, um, not seeking rents from the state. I, I was wondering if any of your var variables kind of drill into an understanding, or, or, or is there a different understanding of entrepreneurship among, among Russian respondents? If, if you can kind of briefly address that before we go to Dennis. Uh, so just a quick, uh, by the way, um, a response on methodology I didn't mention. Uh, this survey has been run as an addendum to Levada's uh, monthly um, uh, omnibus polls. Uh, these are face-to-face -face, uh, interviews. Uh, so they are quite reliable, and the sample uh, consisted of uh, 1,600 uh, respondents. So these are quite um, uh, quite a representative survey of the Russian population, and it also actively 
uses data of the previous, uh, um, relies on the data from previous Levada surveys. Uh, to answer your question, uh, Brian, it's a really good one. We didn't really do a lot of, um, so I think Dennis actually has be, will be able to comment a little bit perhaps on it. Um, we uh, did run qualitative focus groups uh, before, but I don't think we specifically explored like how they understand entrepreneurship, but it's at least the focus group that we run with um, a younger um, uh, population in Russia, they, they demonstrate that uh, the younger groups are quite aware of what entrepreneurship is. In fact, they willingly name uh, these activities that they'd like to engage to. Um, not all of them necessarily, you know, legal, but definitely all of them are, uh, do classify as um, uh, entrepreneurship on uh, the regular, um, on the regular definition. I have to say that these bigger scale surveys, they don't necessarily, um, unfortunately, they're not uh, always uh, allow us the technology to understand exactly what respondents think about a particular topic or how they define it. Other methods are better uh, to do it. But you are not wrong in the sense that there is a lot of um, confusion in the uh, minds of the population about what uh, doing uh, businesses and what entre entre entrepreneurship is. Um, and so, of course, that we get a little bit of uh, confusion when they answer this question, but the data is still reflective of certain trends when you look at it in uh, dynamics. And the fact that, for example, um, there is lower credibility of small and medium enterprises in the Russian population as opposed to, to the church is definitely still revealing because the respondents, they more or less understand what what small and medium enterprises are. So by asking different questions that more or less address the same topic, we're able to still get a clear picture. But of course, since only about, uh, you know, 10, 10, 15% of our respondents actually have ever had the personal experience in doing business, having their own business, of course, uh, and that given again, the fact that many of them receive the information from state uh, linked TV channels, of course, the general perception of what doing business is, is going to be slightly different in Russia as opposed to other countries where people, for example, have more experience uh, with these activities. Great, thanks, Maria. And I want to kind of go to Dennis now. Dennis, great to see you again. It's been a while. Um, I wanted to come to you with another, what looked to me at first glance, as a contradiction in Russian attitudes towards entrepreneurs, entrepreneurs and entrepreneurship. Um, only 14% of Russians have experience running their own business. And that number is actually declining. So that number is declining as like trust in entrepreneurs is going up, which I found very, very interesting. Um, and while about just over a quarter of the population say they would like to open their own business, nearly three quarters found of those polled found it difficult to open a business in Russia. Only a fifth of the population thought that the business environment in Russia was actually improving. So how do these apparently, what I see as very negative attitudes about the business climate um, and these the very small number of Russians that have experience operating a business or even want to operate a business, how do these square with the very positive attitudes we see about entrepreneurship per se? Because I, I found that kind of contradiction very interesting. Uh, hello, Brian. Uh, good to see you. Hello, everyone. Uh, actually, um, I must add that when we ask generally uh, if uh, our respondents would like themselves or their uh, children, for example, be businessmen and answer to uh, themselves, then the, uh, the figure is much uh, bigger. It's almost one half a population that would like uh, uh, to to, to uh, be in such uh, capacity. Uh, but exactly because the conditions are so harsh, uh, we have only this, uh, I would say, the minority, rather tiny minority, only a quarter of our population who actually are ready and want to uh, open their own business exactly because the uh, conditions are bad. and. Uh, also, I think uh, I can develop on, uh, you have already discussed with uh, uh, Maria about the state-aligned uh, businessmen, uh, uh, why they're so popular. Partly, I think it's again because of the context. Uh, uh, people in Russia understand quite well what is uh, needed for doing business in Russia. And uh, when we ask it, uh, uh, when we ask it, 
what is needed first is of course startup uh, capital but the second requirement is uh, uh, government connections con connections uh, with the well state bodies to run the business and also the third uh, state support and only then talent and good uh, business idea actually with those who have the experience of uh, running business they uh, uh, tend to uh, appreciate government connections and state support even higher than the uh, population uh, in general. So this and uh, also this uh, understanding who is the most res uh, respected bus businessman, actually not, and uh, um, we were not asking about the entrepreneurs, but about the business businessmen. So not uh, uh, much, um, Mm, difficulties uh, in this. So, businessman, uh, businessman, it's uh, <laughs> a person who is doing business. Uh, <clears throat> so, it's uh, it, everywhere in our results. Uh, we see that this uh, rather hostile context, or uh, I would say, context uh, which is very much connected to the state and the state interference in the economy. It's reflected in uh, in many of uh, the answers that respondents give. So uh, uh, probably I uh, I answered uh, uh, your question. Maybe I I can add uh, uh, a little bit about uh, what um, difficulties uh, uh, people see in uh, doing business. And uh, it is uh, number one is uh, high taxes. Uh, the second one again is uh, corruption and uh, so the again the presence of the state and the, that you, you need to bribe official to have some achievements actually it's what people are saying uh, quite freely and uh, then lack of capital and high uh, interest rates which I would say almost uh, uh, the same uh, part of uh, this uh, the second part of the same uh, problem the lack of uh, the lack of capital so I can end uh, here for for a bit. Actually, I want to kind of stick through another question at both of you, because what I'm hearing is that the public tends to view the state as hostile to business. Is that would that be a fair characterization of it? I guess, would they, is, do you, did you sense in your answers of your respondents almost a, a, a sense that the state was an impediment to doing business, even though people understand that you need to have good connections with state officials in order to successfully do business. Um, would that be a fair assessment? Uh, well, uh, partly yes, but I must, I must say that it seems like routine. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and uh, again, with the problems that uh, businessmen experience, according to our respondents, uh, this state pressure does not come as the main difficulty. But when we ask about them, uh, uh, these cases directly, then uh, again, as Maria has already said, that uh, uh, this um, uh, a pressure from the this, uh, um, bodies that check uh, the, uh, the the checks the business activities, it is uh, it is named as a problem and as a uh, routine by half of our respondents. So, and uh, uh, interestingly, uh, what we got from focus groups, for example. Uh, so we have these uh, uh, problems as a uh, result of uh, survey. And then we discussed some, uh, some problems with the respondents on focus groups. And I liked how uh, uh, people just discussed it. Uh, uh, and uh, we saw, for example, like one of our respondents said, we calcul we uh, wanted with uh, with my wife we wanted to open business so just uh, but we sat down we calculated all the difficulties and thought otherwise rejected this idea so it's a calculation about this day-to-day um, uh, -day routine that is uh, hostile and and also the state doesn't help doesn't provide conditions that uh, pe uh, people are actually willing to to explore but uh, do not find this condition maria would you add anything to that because i'm what i'm actually trying to drill into here with all of my questions is the extent to which these attitudes about entrepreneurship actually represent modernizing attitudes um and the state in russia is 
more of a part of the landscape than it would be in countries farther to the West? And to what extent can we measure entrepreneurship as almost a surrogate for moder for modernizing attitudes? So if, you, if anything you, you would add to, to, to what Dennis had to say. Uh, so, um, so one important take away just for our audience to clarify that definitely there is modernizing. I mean, defend, modernization is a very debated, contested uh, point, and certainly uh, in political science, I can I should mention that. Uh, but in general, in the, if we view uh, modernization and set of attitudes necessary for create contemporary democratic capitalist society, we see at least some of the indicators definitely demonstrated that on the global level, people develop these attitudes. As they engage in these activities more as the capitalism, capital society becomes part of their day-to-day -day life. This is contrast, this is in sharp contrast with the attitudes of the Russian elites that actually have very different uh, attitudes towards entrepreneurship and business. Uh, Putin, for example, um, recently mentioned that some people, quote unquote, believe uh, that businessmen are all crooks, essentially, and he doesn't disagree. So I'm not di quoting directly, but the idea was like that. Uh, the Russian elites have been shaped, uh, the, their views and perceptions have been shaped throughout the Soviet years, and it was a very particular vision of uh, a businessman being a so-called speculant, so someone who, by definition, steals rather than creates value added. This this is a sharp contrast um, uh, as, uh, to what the population thinks. And I think it's important to highlight that the Russian elites are might, often represents, might, represent much more traditional uh, vision uh, and views of society than increasing number of the Russians. So in this sense, uh, yes, it is modernization. At the same time, uh, to answer your question, Brian, uh, it's, a very important, uh, it's very important to highlight that Russia finds itself in a situation of a so-called institutional trap, if you wish, where uh, the conditions that are created by the state make it impossible to do a successful business unless you have certain type of connections in the state or protection rocket. Uh, because the moment you open it, and if you're not connected to anyone, and if you start uh, doing decent money, uh, there will be a certain group of you know, inspectors coming and finding out that you do not satisfy the requirement of, for example, firemen, and all oh, whatnot, uh, unless you pay certain people a certain amount of money. So you need to be connected by definition to even be able to run uh, the business. And I think what we find is this interesting paradox is that people understand that there is definitely, the, the state, as Dennis said, the state doesn't help. In fact, it actually commonly creates more trouble and common requirements other surveys have demonstrated, especially when businessmen are surveyed, when they asked what can state do for you, the common answer is just leave us alone, please. Like well, all you can give us is just leaving us alone for good. But at the same time, uh, the conditions on the ground are such that you can't work, you can't operate unless you have certain uh, connections in the business, uh, in the state, I'm sorry, with the Kremlin or with the state authorities. So this is this kind of institutional uh, trap setting where uh, purposeful, somewhat purposeful created, uh, almost intentional created, where you would do better off without the state, but at the same time, you cannot do better off uh, without the state. Thank you, Marek. So I guess what I'm seeing here, and actually that's what I was trying to get, is, is there a divergence in kind of elite opinion about this and in the more the, the, the public opinion? Um, because this is a trend we noticed in the past in Ukraine, a big divergence between the elite and civil society. And, and if I've, I've been kind of looking for signs to see if that is developing in Russia. And that would lead me up to the, the final question I want to go to you before we go to the audience. And a reminder to our audience, I see some questions popping up here. Um, I want to remind our audience that if you have questions for our panelists, you can ask them within the Zoom platform. Um, there's a little Q&A box at the bottom of the screen, or you can ask them on Twitter or YouTube if you happen to be watching on those platforms. Um, so I want to ask this question to both Maria and Dennis. So your findings show, and this is coming out in the discussions, that readers are, uh, the respondents are concerned with things like corruption, raider seizures, illegal raider seizures, unjustified criminal prosecutions of entrepreneurs, the state getting in the way of business activity. We've talked about this divergence in the way people view doing business in the elite in, in, in civil society. Given the high opinion Russians have of entrepreneurs in general and the generally dark view they have of the business climate and the state's role in that business climate in which political connections matter uh, more than the rule of law, is there anything in your data that shows a desire for change? 
that this, the, 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 this, this realization that the business climate isn't what it should be. Does your data show anything that this could be a spark for a demand for change? Because this is, I mean, really gets to the modernization question. So I guess, Maria, you want to go first? It's an interesting, more sort of philosophical question. Thank you, Brian. Uh, I will be also interested uh, to see uh, uh, what Dennis thinks about it. I definitely see uh, that certain social groups, so it's important to highlight that there is a variation, very sharp variation across different groups. And the dynamic that we emphasize is primarily discovered among the younger, better educated, better off people with entrepreneurial experience. So again, like those people, those social groups that are the future of the country, hopefully. Uh, so in this sense, yes, they demonstrate the views uh, that, that differ sharply from the trends uh, of the um, some of the um, economic, for example, trends, the, some of the economic policies of the Kremlin in the recent years. We didn't, have, in this particular survey, we did not uh, specifically, at least um, in my reading of this data, did not necessarily ask them uh, specifically about the, um, um, the, the desire for change. We more mostly address the, 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 the vision of uh, the realities on the ground as today. But what we definitely see, and that Brian, I think he also highlighted uh, previously, there is an understanding that there is a lot of harm uh, coming from uh, from the state authorities that they're primarily self-interested, uh, they're primarily corrupt. So their main interest in not, is not well-being of the society, but their own uh, selfish interests and uh, if anything uh, they uh, they're quite familiar at least vaguely familiar with um, uh, the instances of the um, illegal uh, seizures and attacks on the business but at the same time once again this contrasts sharply with more traditionalist trends in the society uh, which actually for example still uh, give us higher approval and higher confidence in um, so, for example, the president, the army, or even uh, security uh, services, as opposed to uh, businessmen. So, there's a lot of contradictory trends. We see a society in dynamic. Uh, there is no one particular, right, uh, strong trend, but it's more like a different combination of different attitudes of people with backgrounds who grew up during the Soviet times, as opposed to people who from had their formative experiences throughout the 1990s and 2000s. And as a result, we see the so-called moving average that tends to evolve. Uh, but this moving average, I think, in general, shows us uh, that when it comes to attitudes towards you know, markets, uh, we definitely see the society that's, that has evolved and changed a lot. Even if the um, demand for change, which I'm once again, I don't think this survey addresses specifically, but we'll see maybe Dennis things differently. Even if demand for change is not necessarily voiced there yet, we see that this, if the trends continue, and they probably will, uh, given the economic situation in the country, we will inevitably see that some kind of demand for change uh, will probably uh, evolve from here. Dennis, do you see any, any, any signs in the data that there's going to be a demand for change? Well, first, uh, I also would uh, like to highlight what uh, Maria has said, uh, uh, that uh, this sharp contrast uh, uh, between what, for example, our president uh, think about businessmen, uh, that all their crooks, thieves, and so on. And uh, this is, uh, it's not only about the president, it's about the ruling elite, because when we are, do, uh, we are in the different project, we're surveying big businessmen uh, uh, independent from the state, they were commenting on this attitude that uh, uh, in, in Russian uh, uh, elites uh, name a business even like commerce. So those, those commerce, commerce will not uh, dictate us our policy, they uh, tend to say. And, uh, but uh, I think that, uh, of course, there is uh, this uh, modernization impact, but it's not straightforward. It's uh, maybe not uh, exactly about the opinions that we have about business. I think it's more about uh, this uh, wish of uh, still considerable part of population uh, wish to uh, doing business. Of course, uh, as we see, part of this business will be connected to the state and they will try to use it and so on. But I think uh, those who uh, 
become businessmen, so uh, those who uh, started to uh, do business, they're already uh, different people. They are more independent in their thoughts. They're more independent in their ideas and uh, they have a broader horizon. They have to uh, understand much more than an average citizen just to be afloat. So in this sense, uh, uh, I think there is a, a, a very, there will be a slow modernizing uh, effect in this uh, positive, uh, positive attitudes to, to doing business. Had, had a trouble finding my mute button. <laughs> we're gonna we're gonna go now. We got about thirty minutes, so we're right on time. Um, and we're gonna go to questions from our audience right now. A very interesting question from Paul Massaro of the U.S. Helsinki Commission. Um, very interesting question. How has the brain drain impacted the entrepreneurial environment? Now I know this is not a subject of your data, but what this suggests is that a large number of entrepreneurs may be missing from Russia because the most entrepreneurial, a lot of the most entrepreneurial people may have left. Um, I know this is not directly the subject of your study, but I wonder if you each could, could address that because I thought that's a, that's, a, that's a very interesting question from, from, from Paul. I don't know if your data shows or Denise, if uh, Levada's data more broadly may show the desire to, to, to leave the country, but I wonder if you could each address that because I thought I will um, more broadly comment from other uh, research that I have done. Uh, so um, it's a huge problem, of course, the brain drain in Russia, specifically for the future of the country. And unfortunately, I'm one uh, representative of this uh, brain drain uh, um, that uh, people who uh, would have done a lot to you know, benefit for the future of the country, given the unfavorable conditions on the ground, uh, live uh, in big numbers. Uh, and of course, that actually limits uh, the challenge and the protest uh, that otherwise would have uh, Kremlin, uh, the Kremlin would have witnessed. Uh, this is one of the reasons why I always tell uh, to people who are very afraid of the Iron Curtain uh, that we will be reinforced uh, of the way in the way that the Soviet Union actually imposed the Iron Curtain. This is unlikely to happen in today's uh, Russia because this brain drain is actually the key to survival of the longer term survival of the regime. Uh, the talented and uh, protest minded people who are not satisfied with the situation on the ground, who would be the ones to represent this demand for change uh, that you, Brian, asked uh, earlier, uh, they're the most, uh, the ones to actively leave. And of course, uh, that's why uh, the numbers that we, for example, find in the study, probably under report uh, the real numbers um, and probably show less dissatisfaction that would have been otherwise if people who um, wanted to leave the country couldn't uh, do that. Uh, so this sense, uh, this allowing open uh, borders for many contemporary autocratic regimes is actually a key to their sustainability and longer term survival. Uh, but at the same time, everyone cannot leave. Uh, there's just not enough, uh, like particularly at this moment, uh, borders are literally closed. Uh, so you, uh, a lot of people will have to stay in Russia, especially if, uh, in the regions. It's much, it's much harder when you are in the region. And so there's still uh, a lot of people who are talented that who remain in the country and they still face the same obstacles. Uh, some people come back, but uh, in lower numbers, of course. So um, overall, uh, this suggests um, specify that definitely a lot of talented people who could have contributed to the country's uh, well-being unfortunately find themselves outside the country. And this is particularly set for country's future since they represent less uh, demand, for, uh, overall the demand for change is lower in the society than it would have been otherwise. Dennis, what do you think, what do you see? Well, uh, of course this is a, a problem and actually one of the people from our list of most respected uh, businessmen, Pavel Durov, uh, is outside of the country, was forced to uh, sell his social network uh, and uh, so now doing business elsewhere. And this is an indicator, uh, indicator of this uh, very well, rather hostile uh, business climate. So they, uh, many uh, talented people have to leave because they could not, uh, 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 well, realize themselves uh, inside the country. At the same time, at the same time, if we look at the uh, figures uh, 
figures uh, uh, in general. I mean, uh, those uh, there were a lot of rumor, uh, a lot of discussions about our figures that more than half of young people uh, would like to leave Russia. Uh, on these figures, I am more um, I uh, more uh, more calm about them because it, for me it is not. Uh, 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 the indicated that necessarily all these people will leave. I see rather positive on this uh, uh, on this figure that it's uh, for uh, many young Russians. It is uh, uh, an open uh, 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 choice, uh, an option. So they have this idea and they uh, can uh, choose where to go. So for 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 us and I think for Maria as well as we discussed it. It's uh, uh, speaking of young people. These uh, 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 these figures that so so many uh, young Russians think about it and uh, uh, well see it as an option. I think it's a good uh, good indicator for Russia because it's making uh, uh, Russia more uh, at least younger generations of our country more open to the world, more connected uh, connected to the world. So, but of course, I think in uh, uh, every Every figure in every uh, case, we have uh, both positive and negative uh, uh, negative sides. Okay, great. I um, <laughs> interesting that you mentioned Pavel Dudov, and I actually remember when he emigrated, he actually put a an advertisement on social media uh, saying he's seeking a country to be a citizenship of a country that has a positive business environment. I actually remember when, when, when that happened. I want to kind of combine a couple of questions here together. Um, uh, there was one from uh, from Marjorie Ma Mandelstrom Balzer about how representative are respondents from the republics. It's a very kind of methodologically focused question, but that also goes together with a question from Elizabeth uh, Teague, who are asks, forgive me if I mispronounced that, did you find differences in opinions in different regions? Do people in Moscow think differently from those in smaller towns? We noted the difference in education and, and income um, and, and age. Um, how does this play out regionally? So both, both two, combining two questions, how, how represented are the regions and what, what does the data show about the differences in the regions? Um. I will uh, let Dennis respond about if if uh, if you could about the republic uh, representation because unfortunately I don't know uh, uh, how the um, uh, samples constituted but I trust Levada's omnibus is uh, generally representative of uh, the regions more broadly, so the, you can definitely be assured that there's decent representation. Uh, well, at the same time, when it comes to the Moscovites, we do find. Uh, um, quite substantive differences. And I'm sorry I didn't mention it before because that's definitely very important. Thank you for this question, uh, which is definitely in line with the same uh, trend that Moscovites tend to be more modernized or more pro-business than uh, other uh, social groups or other regional average. This is very much in line with the same finding that the younger, better educated, uh, better off uh, people uh, generally tend to view uh, business more positively. Um, also, just a reminder that Moscow in general is one of the most proudest uh, problem cities in the re in the country that actually allows us to address the earlier question to what extent these attitudes are connected to the demand for change. And I think that's just another side indicator that they are. Uh, so Moscow, yes, um, at least my reading of the data was that Moscow is different exactly along the lines that we would expect it to be. Uh, speaking about the sample, uh, it is constructed in the way that it's not representative for uh, special regions. So it's uh, a representative for Russia, for country as a whole. So we are uh, able to look the differences between Moscow is the biggest region and uh, then uh, uh, biggest cities, uh, medium cities, small, uh, small localities. So uh, here is the differences as uh, Maria uh, it, uh, mentioned already, but uh, no, for uh, uh, republics, we have to uh, construct special samples to uh, uh, look into them. So, uh, so we didn't do it uh, for uh, limited resources, of course, but also for because of the uh, uh, sake of uh, delivering the results, because our um, interest was. Uh, more broad uh, to uh, get more broader results, uh, not uh, looking at uh, sp uh, special republics, 
And uh, actually, uh, this is the problem uh, of uh, such a big country uh, as Russia. And uh, I would say uh, right now, the up-to-date uh, uh, data on uh, different, uh, different regions, uh, it's only a Russian state uh, who has this capacity to uh, monitor almost every region, but they uh, do not share the results, unfortunately and keep it uh, uh, for themselves. Uh, so our data is only representative for the country as a whole. Okay, great, thanks. So we have a very engaged audience, lots of questions coming in um, so fast, faster than I can read them. We got two questions from Harley Balzer. I'm gonna kind of combine them together because they're kind of related. Um, part of the question is how, does, how do the data on the number of Russians who want to open their own business compare with other countries? I don't know if this falls into the purview of your research or if you've come across it in your travels. And also uh, Harley Balzer points out that the number of small businesses in Russia is low, but the number of medium-sized businesses is really low. And so why do so few small businesses become medium-sized businesses? Because we assume a lot of most medium-sized businesses were once small businesses and they grew, right? So why, why do we not see this trend towards, towards growth? If, if either of you can tackle that, please. Well, we, uh, we're not uh, looking into, into this, but from uh, uh, other uh, research that we had, uh, and uh, again, speaking with uh, uh, businessmen in Moscow, actually, bigger, big business, uh, and uh, uh, some of them were uh, uh, speaking on this uh, issue, and uh, they said that uh, there's no culture of uh, mm, uh, for the state to uh, allow to, for business to grow. And uh, they were saying that exactly the problem that uh, uh, they do not feel that uh, the government uh, uh, see it's a necessity. And again, maybe looking at uh, uh, nowadays, just uh, this moment uh, with this coronavirus uh, epidemic breaking, uh, uh, breaking out, uh, we see that uh, a Russian state uh, right now is not willing to uh, support uh, medium and small businesses. They again addressing, first of all, big uh, uh, infrastructural uh, companies uh, that answer for big shares of uh, 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 people who are working uh, in them. And uh, it's uh, maybe I think it's uh, uh, they understand how to uh, address this uh, issue, and uh, what, what we what we definitely see that they the lack of um, uh, support for this uh, medium uh, medium business and uh, and and small business and like uh, uh, one of the experts uh, uh, of Yugen uh, said that it's very it's exactly the attitude that uh, the state thinks well they develop themselves. So they will uh, perish maybe, but then they will spring, uh, spring uh, up again. So maybe this is just uh, the problem of the uh, attitude of the state, uh, state officials. Marie, anything to add to that? that uh, yes, thank you very much, Denis. So uh, Professor um, um, uh, Halter, thank you very much for a great question. So first of all, uh, def we unfortunately didn't do the comparison across different countries. I think that's something where uh, we could take it further as a possible uh, development. But here, for example, I had a chance uh, during Denis's response to check uh, one of the uh, polls in the United States where uh, the majority of the Americans uh, dream of opening uh, a business about two thirds uh, from survey to survey, right? In the Russian case, just for comparison, we find 27%. Uh, so less than a third, as opposed to uh, the United States, uh, where we find over two thirds. Again, that's, of course, that depends on the methodology. So I don't know how comparative this country, uh, this data is, but it kind of gives you the models comparative uh, framework, what to compare it to. Uh, second of all, uh, we also cite, uh, Denis actually uh, cites this um, other study comparatively in um, our report, 
Um, so only one in five Russians, about 20%, uh, believe that it's easy to open a new business in Russia. And there's, this is the data of comparative, from comparative study by Global Entrepreneurship Monitor that actually found that, for example, um, um, as opposed to 20% in France, um, about 40%, 45% in the United States think it's relatively easy to open their own business. Sweden, Poland, and Netherlands actually uh, have this number at over 70%. Again, uh, from all the comparative data, even if it's definitely worth uh, doing more of this cross-country comparisons, uh, we find that uh, the Russian numbers are significantly lower. And again, who is to blame it? This is totally rational. If you know anything about the business climate in Russia, that shouldn't come as a surprise. Uh, but this is unfortunate because it kind of shows you how much opportunity the country loses uh, because of the economic policies of the state. And of course, when it comes to the medium uh, enterprises and why they're, why they're so few, that's, I think it's a great uh, research question, very interesting. Uh, so I just uh, give a hypothesis here, which is definitely not tested, but I suspect that as a small business, it's somewhat easier for you to stay, stay under the state radar uh, in most cases, uh, especially given that many small businesses can actually operate in this grayish zone. There's a big business. You, if you run a big business in Russia, there's no other way, one way or another, you're connected to the state. So you gotta have certain connections that protect you, give you a protection rocket. But it's, it's precisely when you're in the medium business, when you're at that point where your profits are good enough so that it's actually quite a big attraction for different inspections bodies and uh, who not to try to um, uh, exhort bribes and other things. And at the same time, you might not uh, have connections. Um, or it's not a given that you have connections at that level. And so it's possible that this is where you find yourself in the most dangerous zone and get under that tax. Terrific. Thank you. Thank you, Maria. And I wanted to apologize. We didn't, we didn't uh, say uh, Professor Balzer's affiliation. He's a professor at Georgetown University, and I, I neglected to mention that. Uh, got a couple of questions from Ryan Kurz um, that are related again. Um, how difficult is it for small and new businesses in Russia? What kind of access to, to, to liquidity in the banking sector do they have? How difficult is it for them to raise capital? This kind of does go beyond the scope of your study, of course, but I, I, I'm wondering if either of you could comment on, on that. Um, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't uh, turn off my uh, sound. So I have actually my original training, believe it or not, in economics and I worked many years with uh, Professor Evgeny Yesin, um, uh, research head of high school of economics. So I can only comment very briefly. Unfortunately, I haven't really researched this topic for a while, but in, different, uh, in general, uh, raising capital is a big issue, especially after sanctions, uh, Western sanctions have been in place uh, because in the past what happened is a lot of uh, Russian businesses actually tended to rely uh, on uh, Western uh, capital markets. And uh, since uh, 2014, uh, uh, since the sanctions have been introduced, uh, getting access to that uh, capital has become increasingly difficult uh, for the Russian uh, businesses, uh, in part not necessarily because sanctions explicitly ban uh, access to capital markets for everyone, but because there's just Western banks just don't want to be engaged, you know, or companies just afraid to be engaged with Russian businessmen for good reasons, because they might or may not be subject to the sanctions. So that actually has become uh, a big problem. Uh, then again, you see that uh, the state, the Russian state tries to substitute somewhat uh, for it by providing access to this uh, state uh, capital, Russian state capital for this uh, national project projects and other initiatives, but those, of course, are quite uh, low in scale, uh, come with huge strings attached. Um, typically, if you engage with the Russian states, there is uh, associated uh, requirements in one way or another, and they are nowhere near to compensate uh, for uh, this issue. But this, however, not to say that uh, that is what uh, we see, I see personally as a fundamental problem, because I see as a fundamental problem in Russia, I see, uh, honestly, the lack of the business climate and necessary policies that would eventually uh, you know, create the situation in which Western sanctions really are not, not don't get imposed in the first place. Yeah. Dennis? Uh, so even in our uh, survey, we see that the lack of capital and high interest rates is the main problems for doing business. 
according to our respondents. And uh, again, in the uh, uh, survey and interviews that we are doing with the uh, uh, big business with Andrei Mavchan from uh, Carnegie Moscow, uh, uh, people were uh, talking about two, uh, two problems here. So one, uh, my already commented uh, on uh, the lack of uh, international uh, international funding uh, well because it's uh, not only uh, dangerous now to uh, get under sanctions but it because it's very hard to predict a at least uh, a couple of years ago it was very hard to predict uh, how the sanctions will expand and for business uh, predictability is very uh, very important and the second issue of uh, 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 Russian state uh, uh, funding, uh, there was uh, uh, the problem uh, and is a problem that uh, Maria uh, hasn't yet mentioned. It's uh, that it's rather dangerous. Uh, businessmen uh, said it is very dangerous to have uh, to uh, take money from Russian state because uh, then uh, uh, if you spent, uh, spent something or lose something, uh, not uh, uh, intentionally because it's business, it's chances always, but uh, from the lush, uh, Russian law enforcement uh, institutions, it's always uh, seen as theft. It's breaking conditions and uh, it means that you will go to prison. Uh, so this uh, uh, by uh, these uh, uh, businessmen who we were to, uh, talking to, this was the main, the main problem. And the second problem uh, uh, was it's it's too complicated. So uh, uh, and one of the um, uh, 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 was it recommendations that uh, uh, these businessmen were uh, uh, giving that make it simple, make it simple, make it one window, uh, give it to everyone for for everyone to have the same opportunity to apply for those funding. So it's very, very complex and not everyone understands uh, or even aware of there is any, uh, any uh, benefits. But those who are aware, many just don't want to have anything in common with this just because they are afraid of this. Uh, just uh, just a funny yeah. anecdote, if I could add, I'm sorry, very quickly to Danny's point, a very important point, uh, so that I can demonstrate that the domestic situation is much worse. So there was uh, a tax amnesty announced uh, by uh, the Kremlin um, uh, last year, which actually still convinced some of the um, uh, businessmen to come back uh, to the country and uh, report, essentially give the documents to the authority. And immediately uh, last year, there was an announcement when not one of the businessmen who again believed this announcement came back, he was arrested. As a result, precisely of the documents that he provided uh, under the announcement of this tax amnesty. And that of course happens all the time. Yeah. Well, that, that's not uh, going to contribute to a good business environment. I'll say that for sure. Um, we in our as if as if we planned this, our timing is almost perfect. We have one more question. We have seven more minutes. Um, and this one comes from uh, Gideon Werner, if I'm pronouncing correctly, the Polish chair at the School of Business at Quinnipiac University, which also happens to be in my wonderful home state of Connecticut, where maybe my mother is even watching right now. Um, and the question is as follows. Um, is the, it's a follow-up on the question about the brain drain. And the question is, is there data on the number slash percentage of young people who have left Russia, or is the information we're getting just anecdotal? And where are the young Russians going? What are their target countries? I, I apologize to both of you. I know this doesn't fall within that purview of their study, although it is an interesting question, and perhaps you've come across data that can address it. Um, bear in mind, we have very little time left. So keep your answer very brief, so we'll have time to wrap up. Well, uh, do not uh, have... Uh data uh, on uh, uh, exactly directions that uh, uh, young Russians are taking. But if you look at uh, the uh, surveys, uh, uh, what they uh, will say before leaving the country, what are the main uh, countries they're looking at? It's with young Russians, uh, uh, first of all, from biggest cities, uh, it's still Western countries. Uh, uh, actually, not only for uh, for uh, young Russians, for the uh, country as a whole, but with the younger Russians, it's uh, 
uh, even more so that in spite of all confrontations that we had uh, uh, with the West, uh, uh, when we uh, ask about uh, what countries do you, would you like Russia to cooperate? Yes, it's China, it can be Belarus and others. If we ask about what country would you like to visit? What country would you like to go to work to? Uh, what country would you uh, uh, like to go to live forever? It's France, Germany, Germany, first of all, Europe, Europe, uh, and even United States. But United States, it's, uh, I would say, too far away from, from Russia. But even, even so, uh, in our answers, uh, we see that even United States, Maria, anything to add? Last word to you. Uh, some official data. Uh, that, so there are multiple attempts at making those estimates. There's official data by Rostat uh, that, uh, for example, in 2017, I think reported about 400,000 people who left, but it definitely underestimates the real numbers uh, by maybe three, four, uh, maybe even as much as six times. Uh, we have the UN uh, nation uh, data that ranks Russia at the third largest number of people uh, living outside of the borders, uh, about 11 million. But we, of course, don't know why they live outside the borders as well. Uh, may have been the, some kind of legacy of the uh, Soviet Union. Uh, but in any case, uh, some estimates, uh, uh, are, there, there's multiple attempts to making those estimates. Uh, I'm sure you will be able to find uh, more of this data online if you look. Uh, none of them, of course, is reliable. And what is definitely not reliable is uh, the official data. Because as I said, uh, most Russians, even if they relocate, they don't uh, give up their citizenship. And so as a result, uh, the number of the real people who uh, relocate is definitely underestimated. And uh, in a lot of ways, Russia really resembles Iran, where, again, we observe a very similar situation with huge immigration of the youngest, brightest, uh, most talented people abroad because of the conditions on the ground. Terrific. Thank you very much. And actually, uh, Professor Werner just sent a, a note saying, just as a reference point, two, almost two million young Polish people, uh, Polish citizens have left Poland for other EU countries, just for, for, a, for a point of, of, of reference. And on that note, I'd like to, to wrap it Thank you to all, to both of our panelists, Maria Snegavaya, an adjunct fellow at SIPA and a postdoctoral fellow at Johns Hopkins University, and Denise Volkov, who is a Moscow-based sociologist and deputy director of the Levada Center. Center. And also like to remind everybody that you can read this report, you can download and read this report. It is at uh, www.sepa.org. I want to remind everybody to stay safe out there, keep washing your hands, keep social distancing, and I uh, hope you're all well. And I also like to thank our virtual audience out there in YouTube land. We'll see you all soon. And we will be discussing this topic again on Friday with Maria on the Power Vertical podcast. So on that note, I bid you all good day. <laughs>